With over 300 different creature types in Magic the Gathering, there are bound to be more than a few weird ones out there. Most creature types in the game are fairly standardized with humans, elves, goblins, and so on and so on, covering large swaths of the cards available. But there are plenty of creature types that are entirely unique to Magic the Gathering in its multiverse, or perhaps feel strange within it. Some of these rare types are only explored for one set with only a few cards before being forgotten entirely. Starting us off at number 10, we have Zubera. Zubera are specifically a subspecies of spirit found in Kamigawa. Usually with Magic the Gathering creature types, even if there's a specific name for a specific creature within an already established creature type, for simplicity and synergy's sake, the creature type used will be the more general type. An example of this is how starred Ruzalka is only referenced as a spirit in its creature type despite having Ruzalka, a specific type of spirit, in the name. Zubera were specifically made to not only be spirits, but also carry their own specific creature type as well. This is of course because of the playstyle of Zuberas. As seen on the floating dream Zubera, the idea of Zubera play patterns was that whenever one died, its effect would happen equal to the number of Zubera that have already died this turn. So if Dripping Tongue Zubera was your first Zubera to die on turn, you would make one token with its ability. And if this was the sixth Zubera to die, you'd make six instead. The most simple way to template this in Magic the Gathering would be via creature type. And since this was specifically an ability for Zubera and not the other spirits of Kamigawa, Zubera was made into its own creature type instead. This initial wave of Zubera support would not see much play outside of draft events for Kamigawa format. In this set, Savers of Kamigawa, there were two more Zubera, although they strangely enough did not have the same style effect as their predecessors. Burning Eye Zubera and its blue counterpart both had bonus effects whenever they died as a result of excess damage over the required 3 damage one would need to kill it. These two new Zuberas were also uncommon, unlike the original 5 which are all common. This common rarity would be the reason why Zubera would see a second chance at relevance as a Rogue Popper format deck. Since Popper can only use commons and the Zubera can provide quite the advantage engine if left unchecked, some Popper players have taken to using Zubera as their primary engine of a combo deck that sacrifices Zubera to cards like Village Rites to dig deeper into the deck for spells like Undying Malice to cheaply bring them back and keep the chain going. While far from competitive, it's a rogue option that's existed in Popper for as long as the format itself. Of course, with Zubera having at least found a home somewhere in the TCG, that's why they're only at the number 10 spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Fractals. Fractals are the most recent creature type on this list, having first debuted in the Strixhaven set as the mascot creature of one of the colleges of the Strixhaven setting. Being the mascot of the School of Math and Science, the Fractals are literal living embodiments of mathematical concepts that they're named after. Mages took geometric figures and curves and abstracted them to the point of taking on life itself. These are essentially living beings of pure math that are reshaped into whatever form is most useful at the given time. In gameplay terms, this means fractals are mostly made by other cards instead of being printed on their own. They are also among the small group of creatures that begin with zero power and zero toughness. This is because most ways to produce fractals have conditions for placing counters on the fractals as it enters the battlefield. E6 Fractal Bloom is the only creature in the game with the actual printed creature type of Fractal. Every other card to reference Fractals creates a 0-0 token that has counters placed on it. Cards like Dika Fractal Theorist show that these creatures are easy to make as they are reshaped in how many different sizes of Fractals that the card can make based on what you do. In this case, making different sized Fractals based on the math values of certain spells you cast. As such, Fractals are often the payoff or bonus effect of cards to further assinuate their roles as helpers and test subjects and experiments. While there are countless creatures who narratively serve others as beasts of burden, Fractals are an example of an artificially created species that fully leans into the lore through gameplay and how you need to play cards or creatures that are capable of creating these malleable creatures for your turn, with stats often varying and depending on the actions you've taken and the current game state. Given their relative recency, it's hard to say if fractals remain an obscure species relegated mostly entirely to tokens, or if that was merely a side effect of the light first wave of support. Despite that, their inherently lacking stat line and current existence only on other cards for the most part solidly earns them a number 9 spot on this list. And at number 8, we have Incarnations. These are a creature type that date back to the set Judgment. As their name implies, they are physical incarnations of intangible concepts such as anger. The original cycle of incarnations all had the same gimmick of their effects working on the graveyard, such as Wonder reoccurring itself to the graveyard to give flying to your creatures on the battlefield. Later on in the Lorewind block, they would return to the creature type while also vastly altering its playstyle. Now, instead of working in the graveyard, incarnations like Guile have more typical effects on the battlefield and are shuffled back into the deck after being sent to the graveyard in a mirror of how the original incarnations were. And then in Modern Horizons two years later, we would get a third cycle of incarnations. The first wave worked in the graveyard, the second wave worked on the battlefield, and this third cycle of incarnations worked in the hand. These new incarnations, such as Fury, all had enter the battlefield effects that offered various forms of disruption, like how Fury deals 4 damage divided amongst multiple targets. More importantly, however, each one can also be cast for an alternative cost of X on a card of the same color from your hand, and having to sacrifice the creature as soon as it enters the battlefield. While this ability, called Evoke, denies you that creature on board, you do get their enter the battlefield effect all the same. 
This has proven to be quite potent in constructed formats with decks built around these creatures seeing success in Modern and Legacy. This is in part due to the newest incarnations having the elemental creature type, offering synergies with cards like Risen Reef. Some of the evoking incarnations like Solitude even have Flash, which provides even more flexibility in their use as you can use them during your opponent's turn. This creature type has seen a rework every time it's been explored, and has recently found playability in its new style, which is quite strange by most creature type standards. And yet it is even weirder that when you're using these creatures, you're literally fighting with your emotions and personality traits. And at number seven, we have Atog. Atog is among the oldest creature types in the game, dating all the way back to the antiquity set. The original Atog was a small creature that grew stronger by eating artifacts. This was depicted in game by having the Atog grow stronger temporarily every time you sacrifice an artifact to it. Later, the game would expand to this hunger creature with many variants, like Four Atog, who had a similar ability to the original Atog, but instead required the player to sacrifice Forest. Each color received an Atog, like White with Oratog, who eats enchantments, and then even further onto multicolored Atogs that could eat multiple things based on their two colors of mana. One of these two colored Atogs, Psychotog, would see competitive play in the pre modern days of organized play. It was the primary win condition of many control decks which would empty your opponent of all resources and creatures before swinging with their Psychotog. Psychotog's ability to grow larger was based on discarding cards and exiling cards from the graveyard. This meant a control player eager to wrap a game up quickly upon seeing an opening could discard their entire hand to buff Psychotog and then exile those very same cards from the graveyard to add even more damage. While within the lore of the game, Atogs were meant to be more pets than anything, Psychotog was not even the only Atog to make for competitive showings. The original Atog would also see success in the Popper format, where its small cost, along with the higher number of relevant common artifacts in the format, allowed it to be the main combat threat of many artifact decks in the format, until it was eventually banned. Of course, many other Atogs were fairly lacking in competitive potency, with Crone Atog being so staggeringly bad as to ask you to skip future turns just to give it an attack boost. With Atog banned in the one format it was relevant in, and Psychotog having long since power crept, this strange creature type has found itself mostly relegated to the realm of Commander. Decks built around the creature type in that format are often built around a Togatog, a legendary Atog whose own strength growing ability works when you sacrifice an Atog to it, meaning that the only legendary member of the creature type is one that gleefully eats its fellow members. These strangely voracious creatures remained oddly relevant despite their age up until their most playable member was outright banned in its signature format. And at number six, we have Beebles. Beebles are an especially interesting creature type in that they were initially not meant to exist at all. The first depiction on an actual card was an Equilibrium, where flavor-wise they represented souls. The creature design would be used again on an actual creature card with Bouncing Beebles in Urza's Legacy. For years, this would be the only legal creature cards of the Beeble type. Beyond this, they were mostly relegated to card art set within the setting of Tolarian Academy. Beebles were homunculus made by the Academy for students to practice magic on, and were often swept up into the more light-hearted card art. This spirit would continue in their only other printings, in the gag Unsets, there, Beebles would see comparably much larger representation, to the point of even getting a Planeswalker card in the form of Bob, Bevy of Beebles. However, these cards are from a joke set and fairly detached from the greater canon of the game. There has been one constructed legal Beeble since the original Urza's block, but even Bamboozling Beeble still originates from a comedy set. It's simply one that also had a selection of legal cards which included this Beeble. Beebles have had a very short-lived existence in the actual tournament legal world of this game, and seem to now be stuck almost entirely in supplemental gag sets. And at number 5, we have Volver. The Volver are a creature type that exists only in the Apocalypse set. There were five Volvers forming a cycle, one of each color of mana in the game. Each Volver in turn would then have an ability called Kicker, which essentially allows you to pay an extra cost for a spell in exchange for an extra effect. Each Volver had two potential Kicker costs, each cost being a different color that in turn would supply a different effect. Blue would give Autovolver flying, while black would give it regenerate, and both would also give it a plus one plus one counter as well. A player could choose to pay for one or even both and get different benefits accordingly. More specifically, these kicker costs were an ally color and enemy color. For those unaware, each color in Magic the Gathering has an ally and enemy color. Ally colors are colors that complement the philosophy and style of the color, whereas enemy colors are colors that contrast that. Black being death-centric is an enemy color with green, which is about life. Green in turn is an ally color with white, which has similar feelings towards life. While the specific ally and enemy pairs aren't important here, what is important is that the Volvers were an early example of exploring enemy and ally colors together. Early magic was very much focused on singular colors of mana, with multicolored cards often being very expensive and offering very little compared to their single color counterparts. Eventually, two color cards and strategies would be more focused on, but three color schemes were generally far less common. This was one of the earliest attempts at balancing three color cards, in this case by exploring it through kicker costs to see how these creatures would react in different types of mana. This tied back to the lore as mutants warped by interference by otherworldly forces. 
Interesting enough, the mutant creature type would be added to Magic the Gathering a few years later on in the Onslaught set with the Mistform Mutant. However, to this day, the Volvars, despite being mutants within lore, have not had mutant added to their creature type and remain distinctly Volvars to this day. This may of course be because they are at least partially forgotten, with no Volvars having been printed since the initial run in Apocalypse. And at number 4, we have Flag Bearers. Flag Bearers are something of an enigma among creature types. Most creature types tend to be fairly loose and disconnected from one another, and generally speaking, not every human is going to do the same thing as each other. Oftentimes, card design will make cards complementary, but overt synergies focused solely on chain creature types are often relegated to larger creature types with pools of creatures to build off of. Flag bearers have exactly two creatures among their numbers, both of which have effect text that is entirely identical. Both Standard Bearer and Coalition Honor Guard both make it so that if your opponent is going to target anything, it must target at least one flag bearer as long as one is a valid target. Since the card itself is a flag bearer, it essentially turns itself into a lightning rod for any interaction your opponent might have that targets. This effect might not seem uncommon on a one-off creature, but it's rare to see a creature type have such a specific ability around the entire type. Especially since the ability does very little to synergize with other flag bearers, seeing as how adding more flag bearers simply gives your opponent more options for their abilities or spells to target. You can't even use this card with something like a Mii Boy Changeling to force your opponent to target something you want removed by turning it into a flag bearer, since your opponent has free range to pick whichever flag bearer they want to target. The most effective way to use a flag bearer is to steal positive effects from your opponent that they would have wanted to target their own creatures with. This effect is so underwhelming that it's no surprise Wizards has never returned to the creature type in any legal setting. However, as a part of the Mystery Booster product, players at conventions were able to open a copy of the parody playset card and roll in the Coalition, which has the effect of enchanting the player and making them into a flag bearer. This gag card goes to show how much seriousness Wizards treats a mechanic, considering it's the first and only card to reference the type or its mechanic in over a decade. And at number 3, we have Metathran. Metathran first appeared in the Urza's block as one of the species that titular character Urza created in one of his many generic experiments. As such, they are one of the wholly original races of Magic the Gathering, a species of blue, masculine, yet sexless humanoids bred to specifically be great warrior. Of course, their cards offer little hints to this, with none of the eight proving all that impressive on the battlefield. The Metathran are spread thin over eight cards and lack any form of competitive impact in any formats. Beyond this, if you were to look at all but the most two recent Metathran printed, you'd find that their original cards do not even have their proper Metathran creature type included. Metathran Soldier was just printed as a soldier, and the actual Metathran creature type did not get added retroactively for this card until the Great Creature Type update in 2007. The creature type only existed in lore beforehand, which at the time was primarily available in novels. This update retroactively added a handful of Metathran into the game, inadvertently making the creature type even weirder with Living Airship was changed from a ship to a Metathran. Lore implies that two Metathran pilot the ship, yet the creature's current creature type is only Metathran, which implies the ship itself can also be considered one of them. It's rare for a creature type to lack cohesion to this degree, especially with only 8 cards. The average player will be unable to tell what a Metathran actually is, since they're depicted as both ships and humanoids. And at number 2, we have Coward. Coward is unique in that for most of its existence, it was never inherently on any card or token. It appeared first in Future Sight, a set that aimed to predict what the future of magic might look like. Among this vision of the future was Bulware Intimidator, a 7 mana giant warrior whose first line of effect text reads, Cowards can't block warriors. This line of text has become well known to the point of becoming a runny joke of the magic. Bulware Intimidator's other effect allowed it to turn creatures into cowards or warriors at will, essentially creating a scenario where the player could police what creatures could be blocked by what via changing things into cowards and warriors. Notably, this interacts poorly with changelings, which are every creature type all at once. Since coward is an official creature type, every changeling is a coward. However, being a coward has no direct repercussions. It's only when Bulware Intimidator is out that coward is a negative trait, or its fellow warrior Cargon Intimidator, who has the same line of text. Other than those two Intimidators, every other card that references Coward does so for flavor text reasons. Pyrophobia primarily uses it to deal damage, but also makes it so cowards are unable to block. Its use of cowards is mainly a tongue-in-cheek joke, but also serves as a way to serve as anti-changeling tech, since changelings were a draft archetype in the set Pyrophobia was printed in. The Cladheim set also saw Magic's first printed coward, Craven Hulk, whose cowardice is represented in being unable to block alone. Between existing primarily as a status effect to be given to other creatures, and perhaps the only creature type designed in some ways to be inherently negative, Coward, that's why Coward takes number two spot on this list. Some could argue it should be the number one choice, but however, when it comes to weird creature types, there's one creature type that surpasses even Cowards in weirdness. And finally, the number one weird creature type is Weird. While the name alone should be enough to explain their spot on this list, Weird are quite strange beyond that. 
They're another example of a subspecies race, being a form of elemental found in the plane of Ravnica. However, these are not classified as elementals at all and are entirely referred to as weirds exclusively. There is one weird wizard, but most other weirds are not even sentient enough to obtain a class like wizard. These red and blue aligned elementals are found in the Azet Guild, usually as the test subjects are products of experiments. Weirds are walking paradoxes, formed of conflicting elements forced together. Beyond this, there are further subtypes of weirds for different functions. The general lack of cohesion in design and the wide variety of forms and features that come with them point back to their origin point. In the early world building of Ravnica, wizards had designed several creatures that vaguely seemed related and all looked rather weird. Having no ideas as to what to call them, the name weird stuck and became one of the key pieces of the Azet Guild going forward. When it comes to weird creature types, it's hard to beat a creature that's named weird because the designs of all of them just look plain weird. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other weird creature types you think we may have missed, or you have any ideas for future videos similar to this one? If so, go ahead and let us know in the comments down below.